Netflix is always popping out with cool shows about just about any topic manner you can uh, handle. And as a horror fan, I'm constantly on there looking at stuff. And a few years back, I found a really cool season one of an alternative uh, to Walking Dead zombie series called Black Summer. Super dope. Season two just dropped on the 17th, I believe, is when we we uh, saw it updated and we were checking it out. And Black Summer Man, like like I just said, it's an alternative to The Walking Dead, but it very much is still in that vein of a badass zombie show. And today I am super excited to have composer Alec Pirro on the show to talk about the music of Black Summer, season one and two, and uh, just horror in general. But Alec, man, how are you doing? Hey. Right? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. No, thank you, buddy. And we, uh, you know, season two, congratulations, just came out um, uh, out there on Netflix, available for people to check out. I know a lot of people, our convention that we do this in person um, in Northern California, the director of the convention was literally talking about on his Facebook oh, wow. some, some of season two this morning. So oh, that's are, awesome. People are starting to definitely uh, check it out. And uh, the initial reactions, I'm about halfway through, but the initial reactions of the thing are, again, positive. So uh, congratulations. and Thank you. Thank you for the uh, the creepy vibes of what is has been two seasons of this show. Uh, what was it? If we can kind of rewind the clock. I don't sure. know if it was brand new, but when you were coming on board – and you're checking out, you know, the the footage and stuff, and getting to compose this thing. What what was it for you, as a music writer, that that drew you to this project? I mean, first and foremost, uh, John Himes, who created the show, and you know, is the showrunner and director. Uh, I mean, he's first and foremost what drew me to sh to the show. You know, we've been friends a really long time, and never had a chance to work together for years and years. And then this opportunity came up and he kind of, you know, started talking to me about the show very, very early on, like way before anything was shot, was sharing kind of, you know, scripts and different things, talking about music. Um, you know, we definitely share the same kind of musical sensibility when it comes to film and TV. Sure. And, and you know, the process on this show is a little bit different than, uh, than other shows that I score to where, you know, in season one, before they had even started shooting, we're talking about music. And then yeah. he was like, why don't you just go like experiment with stuff and just start writing. And in my head, a lot of times when, you know, that's presented to you, you know, you go and do it. But a lot of times, you know, when you go to actually score the show, when there's footage, that right. stuff is out the window and you're kind of starting over. Right. But in the case of Black Summer, we were so on the same page that I started writing, you know, I think I wrote like 20 or 30 really long pieces, you know, two to four minutes, something like that, where I went in and just started experimenting with, you know, different sounds, just trying to really like deconstruct things and, you know, destroy things with yeah. like X pedals and, you know, different processors and things to kind of, you know, mirror that world in Black Summer, which is just complete, you know, just destruction and like yeah. survival. Yeah. Um, and I wrote all these pieces that John was really digging. You know, we went back and forth on certain things to really kind of, you know, I wanted to really get in his head and, you know, figure out his vision. And, uh, you know, they went to shoot. And then as I was starting to see footage, to my surprise, a lot of these pieces were sort of tempt in. Mm -hmm. as ideas and from there we would kind of sit down you know spot an episode watch uh you know watch the episode and kind of talk about the cues where like hey man this general vibe works but what if it you know developed here and so then i would sort of go back since i had made a lot of the themes ahead of time it was more about then sort of scoring the picture and making things you know fit and work and whatnot so that's interesting to hear you say that they came to you and you got to start messing with stuff before you even yeah. saw anything because out of the composers that we have interviewed, this is the first time I've ever hearing that. It's always it's the first time I've literally ever gotten to do that. Yeah. That's, it's, that's pretty wild. 
it's really, I mean, when it works out, it's amazing because it's kind of the most freeing thing ever. I mean, I love scoring the picture and that's, you know, that's what I do, but right. there is a complete difference when you're not kind of trying to, you know, fit this into here. So it hits with this and builds to this. And, you know, when it's just like, you know what, I'm just going to like go, like, here's this crazy sound that I, that I like came up with or made or found and, that you know there's no rules i can just like and john's really open to that and uh it's it's just it's a really cool thing because you know obviously when we go to score the show the sound design is such a huge part of the show that right. there's a really delicate dance between the score and the sound design to where there's certain points when you're like you wouldn't even notice there was music in there because it's really kind of helping yeah kind of compliment. Compliment. yeah exactly compliment what's happening and so with that, because that's another great point is I think a casual fan, um, movie fan, not just Black Summer fan, because I know I, I sure did before I went to school and was doing classes, even though I knew I was never going to be a sound designer or a composer, the school that I went to in L.A., like, you like sat in on those classes, like just so you could see what like best case scenario when you go and you find a composer for your film, you know, have an understanding of what they're having to do for you. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until in those classes that I was really able to segregate composing and everything that goes into sound design. Yeah. Be because like you just said, the complementary nature of something like Black Summer, the two just go, they interweave with one another. Yeah. So what was that like, you know, working with, you know, that team and collaborating and coming up with the final product? Yeah, I mean, a lot of times, um, we, you know, we'd have discussions ahead of time in terms of like, you know, some of the like main sound design that might be in there so that I could like, you know, kind of stay out of the way. Like if there, if there's a huge like rumbling furnace going, it's like, I'm going to stay away from any like big, like low end pads or bass sounds or, you know, and really try to fit it in there. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like with all shows, when I'm kind of done scoring, Mm -hmm. I send the music to the mix stage. And in doing that, you know, I send them stems of everything. So sometimes, you know, we'll like lose, you know, a synth or a, a different sound to kind of <clears throat> make room for the right. sound design. But the cool thing about this show is, you know, when it's appropriate, there are, you know, some serious like music up moments, but there's a lot of things that like, you know, when you stay out of the way and you kind of service the story and what's happening on the screen and the way Black Summer shot with these long, you know, one take, you know, documentary style things. It's like, it makes it so much, it feels so much more real and terrifying For sure. when it's not just like wall to wall music. And it sometimes is wall to wall music and you can't even tell, you know what right. I mean? So right. it's kind of, it's a fun, it's a really fun show to work on. So when you guys wrap season one, did you know immediately that season two was on the horizon and what it was going to continue because any more you know the fan on the fan side of it any more with netflix we don't know a if we're going to get a season two and if we b if we lucky enough are to get a season two we don't know anymore if it's going to be like a ryan murphy thing where same cast but maybe it's a totally different perspective uh, yeah. different story like I was sitting there at the end of season one, hoping that it was just a linear, you know, like we were just going to get the continuation. Yeah. We, you can't bet on that safely anymore. So did sure. you, did you know, you know, what was going on? What kind of a, a time gap to, to rev back into it? Did you have there? Yeah. I mean, it's hard. It's always hard to know, especially now that, you know, at least a lot of the shows that I'm scoring are streamers. It's like, mm -hmm. you kind of get like watered down information, right. you know, as it's given, um, with black summer, there was a, you know, uh, there's always a hope like, Oh, is there going to be season two? It seemed like season one did really well, but it took a really, it, it took a long time to kind of lock that in. I think there was some like behind the scenes stuff, in terms of, you know, just Netflix and producers, and I, I'm not really sure, but, you know, we had an idea there would be season one or season two, excuse me, but right. uh, 
I, we didn't really know when, but when it did kind of kick in, of course they started shooting and like we finished about half the episodes were shot and then COVID hit. So that kind of like, you know, slowed things down, even though whatever was finished, we were able to do post on. And then there was just like, you know, a month or two after that, before they kind of got to shoot the rest of the episodes. But right. I mean, all in all, it probably took a year because of, you know, COVID and right. it was weird. I just went back and like, you know, started watching some of the show and there, there are like scenes in there that I'm like, Oh my God, I, I totally forgot that I even scored that because it was so, I did it so long ago. Wow. But then there's the more like recent stuff, like episode 207, where, you know, I just finished that and Christmas or whatever. So, huh? Yeah. You know, that is kind of a trippy, uh, thing to sit there and actually contemplate in my mind you were scoring a zombie series in the middle of a yeah, totally. <laughs> it's very appropriate <laughs> <laughs> like that's that is pretty wild so yeah. i mean if from a standpoint from a fan standpoint you know what can you say you know what would be your your kind of stinger if someone hasn't started season two yet what do you and you know the the crew that you have you know talked to and everything what do you think the overall expectation from your guys' side to our guys to our side would be as far as season 2 and the experience that it brings i mean for me i mean season 2 so just ups the ante it mm -hmm. just definitely to me takes it to a whole other level and i mean everybody who works on this show brings their a game and i just i feel like everything about it is next level N not not that season one wasn't like that but it's just different it's just like you know the backdrop for the show now is like you know takes place in the winter so there's just mm -hmm. like the elements of snow and just this vast landscape it's just the way it's done i don't know it was really impressive to to kind of go back and watch because i wasn't able to be at a lot of the mixes or really any of them because of covid mm -hmm. uh, and you know a lot of times i won't really go back and watch a show that i score you know you kind of just want to like move to the next and whatnot um but this one like i i literally binged it and was like oh my god i'm i i feel so lucky to be a part of this this is amazing like the, the music i get to make and how that just just the production on the show the the way it's shot it's like you know there's these takes that like they're seemingly one take for like seven minutes like just right. crazy just it's just done really thoughtful and really well and uh i think for sure if you were a fan of season one you, season two is gonna for sure blow your mind but uh yeah it's it's a it's it's a cool show definitely proud of it and those long takes that you mentioned, that is one of those things. I talked about the, the sound and the music and not knowing the work, but the work that goes into long takes like that, yeah. like yeah. it's that's crazy. And the fact that the show executes them repeatedly and it wasn't just like a special, yeah, oh, that was a cool take they did that one episode. It's like, yeah. no, that is the show. It makes that show that much cooler, man. Um, yeah, it's fun. The music, um, you know, you mentioned the elemental aspect of it, which eventually, no matter you know, what universe or what kind of story the zombie, you know, heroes exist in, the elements really become a threat sooner than later because eventually you're running out of stuff and you're uh, dealing with climate no matter where you are and that i thought that you know it brought a different vibe to your work yeah. uh, the the mood of the show does shift um from season one to season two to you know, upping the ante you know for the characters it kind of ups the the how far would you go factor and the desperation factor and so with that going from one to two and maybe you were writing music for characters in season one and now you're writing for that same character but the music has evolved mm -hmm. do you have any like certain characters that you like 
have just become like an, a fan of, and then that transitions into the music? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, especially, so there are for sure some themes from uh, season one that kind of come back and, you know, have an evolution in season two, but then there were a lot of new themes that I did write for like this one char character, Spears. He has mm -hmm. you know, a, a cool episode, you know, that's kind of, uh, you know, mainly about him and his journey in season two to me, it was really, really interesting and cool. So I got to kind of like write him a specific thing that uh, I think works really well. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's just always fun to take into consideration like the the environment because it just played such a big part of season two for me um, that, you know, you want to stay out of the way of all these like natural sounds like wind or, you know, snow falling or, you know, I was trying to kind of emulate some of that stuff with certain sounds, but at the same time, kind of stay out of the way and be able to support them because I knew that, you know, if you're like out in the wilderness by yourself, it's like just, it's not quiet. Even yeah. Though, even though it is, and it's, it's, you, you want to feel that realness and that kind of, you know, sure. The kind of how terrifying it can be <laughs> for sure um you know this sh beyond this show man like have you always been uh, a lover of, of scary stories or even you know just zombies and what was it for you that kind of like turned you on maybe even before you knew necessarily that you wanted to write music or i don't know chicken egg music came first horror movies came first what yeah. you know what what was it for you that got you into horror was there a particular film or character i'm trying to think of i mean god i mean back in the day like when i was really young i mean obviously like you know night of the living dead and I mean, this isn't really horror, but like even like Toxic Avenger or, oh, yeah. or stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Like I, me and my friends, but I, when I was, I mean, had to be like nine or something. We got really into like special effects makeup, like Rick Baker stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, that just led to kind of it, it opened up all these movies in that genre mm -hmm. that uh, I don't know. They something about them. I don't know. It's something about. It's not easy to effectively be scared when you're watching something mm -hmm. because, you know, you essentially know that it's not real if you're, you know, because it's a movie, you know. Right. Um, but there are certain things throughout the years that have, like, scared the crap out of me where you're like, wow. Like, you, you know, for the next two weeks, you're, like, waking up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and you're kind of like. You know, movie. You know, there's just a lot of things like that. And I just love anything that can like really affect you on an emotional level like that. And horror is one of those genres that just you know really <laughs> cuts deep. <laughs> no, for sure. And it, I feel like one thing that uh, good for the horror genre that's come out of the pandemic is people were. Uh, forced to stay home and maybe discover some horror films that they hadn't before. Mm -hmm. The more independent artists and directors are getting their chance to break into the mainstream. So you're starting to see, you know, films like uh, Hereditary or yeah. the, um, you know stuff like that get a chance to play in that in the theater. And I think that is really cool and. Yeah the fact that you can have um, multiple zombie stories with the common threat that they're zombies, but, you know, Black Summer is completely different than 28 Days Later, sure. which is completely different than, you know, Quarantine. And it's like, I don't know how many other little, you know, sub-genres and sublets that you can necessarily say that about. So that... I think makes horror really cool too, where the vast variety of one common subject has like these like tons of little mini mini subjects that you can pull from is is pretty rad. 
Oh well, yeah, I mean it's it's a real uh, zombies in particular are definitely that's a crowded space for sure. Right. Uh, so yeah, no, I I feel really fortunate to to be working on the show because I do think that it it in its own way has you know made its own sort of like what you're talking about its own space in there that that is like refreshing and somewhat new just a new spin on it you know mm -hmm. so so you know, talking about those films for the horror movie fan side what about the composer side was it a film or was it a, a musical artist or a piece that you heard at some point that made you decide that you were going to compose music I mean, yes and no. Yeah, I mean, yes and no. I mean, I, I started out uh, playing piano when I was like eight. Mm -hmm. And then when I was around 12, 13, I started playing drums. And at that point, I was off on the on the band, you know, mm -hmm. the band route uh, for years and years, you know, doing sessions with all sorts of people and this and that. And uh, the band that I ended up being in in my you know, late teens, early twenties was a band called Dead Z. And mm -hmm. we uh we put out a couple records on DreamWorks and, you know, got to tour the world and do the whole thing. And our music definitely fits very well in the horror genre. It's not scary music, but it's it's more on the kind of, you know, nine inch nails, David Bowie, Brian Eno, right. rock music tip. Yeah, I, I dig that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in kind of exploring you know, I mean, films like, I guess now that I'm thinking about it more, you know, directors like Michael Mann really mm -hmm. inspired me musically. I mean, obviously the, the movies are amazing that he makes, but, you know, his movies, uh, you know, people like Brian Eno, people mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, John Bryan, like th th those kind of, I was, gr I gravitated towards that kind of stuff. I mean, definitely Michael Mann was a big one for me when I discovered his movies back in the day, like Heat and how music was used. Right. Uh, it, you know, it, it just, I don't know. It, it just made me feel something that, yeah, I, I definitely wanted to do that. Even though I was in a band, I knew that, you know, I, this is what I want to do. So I kind of was doing things simultaneously, you know? Right on. Um, and with that now, you know, with some of the composers, um, that we've been fortunate enough to talk to, especially lately, the common thread uh, between the movie composers has been the one cool thing about the pandemic is they all have their like spots that they're able to like work. It's not like being a, a cinematographer where you have to go in yeah. to, to a set. Like, so do you, your setup, do you have like a, a, spot of your own that you're kind of like maybe not singled out necessarily but you're you and your team or just you have a spot that you have been working throughout everything allowing you to to get stuff done still yeah oh for sure i mean i definitely at the beginning of when it was all starting to kind of go down in, right. in in typical uh you know, zombie movie fashion. <laughs> when you're like, I swear this is what's happening. And like the people around me that work with me were like, you're crazy, dude. No, I, I'm like, I'm telling you. Uh, so I quickly got uh, like set up a studio at my house. Yeah. Sure. Just in case, you know, just so I could work there. I had no mm -hmm. idea my kids would like not be in school for a year and like just, just the craziness that happened. But so I set up a studio at home and, you know, I have, uh, I have studios in, you know, uh, in the Valley out in uh, North Hollywood in Los mm -hmm. Angeles, um, which is great. I mean, I'm here now. This is mm -hmm. like a control room and then a big live room and, you know, other kind of production suites here. Um, but when COVID got really bad, one of the guys that works for me, he, he continued to work at the studio, but like we couldn't, we couldn't hang. So mm -hmm. we, I pretty much worked from home which was really cool actually, cause I really pared down my setup and streamlined it. And it was, I, I, I ended up scoring, you know, like most of black summer. I scored this other show, the crew for Netflix. I scored this, you know, this DreamWorks animated series. I do the mighty ones like mm. all from home on, on such a smaller setup. And it like completely worked 
great. <laughs> um, but I would come in here like once a week, but obviously now we're back and it's of course nice to be in a room that is, you know, meant for yeah, listening. Right. And, right. Yeah, yeah it's, it, there's a big difference. You, you kind of forget like, along the way of just the whole pandemic i was like oh, we, we gotta get rid of the studio this is just like we're like you know paying for our lease and you know nobody's there barely and i'm glad that we stuck it stuck it out so over the the course of it just from uh, from a fan perspective you know is there anything that you have discovered uh within the last year that you yourself are really digging watching I kind of, God, I, I went back and kind of watched a bunch of stuff that I hadn't watched that has nothing to probably do with horror. <laughs> no, that's fine. Like, Which is, I mean, I, I don't even know if, you know, I, God, what was I watching? I mean, I watched like, uh, you know, Succession and yeah. Billions and I saw that, uh, I don't know if you've seen the, the Night Stalker documentary. Yeah. for netflix which is yeah. amazing because I, I i you know grew up in los angeles you know santa monica right and so i literally remember being a kid when that was happening so it was just so cool to watch yeah. um that and yeah i mean just a bunch of other stuff you know all the movies that i kind of enjoy i know from a filmmaking perspective it kind of sucks to not have your movie in a theater because that's the yeah. medium that it should be seen in but right. the fact that over the uh, the pandemic, there was just you could like stream movies that were coming out like the next day. It was really kind of cool um, to be able to watch stuff from home, you know. Yeah, the whole uh, HBO uh, WB thing that they garnered together that was like the fans win, and but you know, the filmmakers were not happy. <laughs> yeah, they were pissed. <laughs> Understandably. Yeah, and you know, Christopher Nolan. You know when he had, you know he was super pissed about uh, Tenet, and uh, <clears throat> in our in our circle, you know there were a couple of us on that side, you know who had been you know graduated in the pandemic, and we're in and a few not, more of us in, on our team that you know never you know are just volunteering and helping out and having fun, and so they didn't get it, and I'm like no man like that's hundreds of hours of work, you know, not to mention, you know, the respect that someone like him is already owed type of a thing. But like, that is hundreds of people's hundreds of hours of work. Yeah. So yeah, to, to, to just kind of put it on streaming is shitty, but then yeah. you can't really downplay streaming because without streaming, there would be like no black summer, or there would be no independent horror. So it's like, streaming isn't bad. It's no. just when you're when you're expecting your team to win the Super Bowl, so to speak, and you know you're you're ten and six and you're in the playoffs, but your your aspirations are take a step back and yeah. look towards you know the future. That you know when you're expecting one thing and then overnight you're told another, that does suck. Also, yeah. tenant, if you haven't watched it. And you know anyone who watches that movie one time and tells you they know what the hell is going on is lying to you. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't I haven't seen it. I need to watch it. But again, I, I was hoping to see it in the theater, but yeah, I don't think that's happening at this point. Um, but yeah, stream. I mean, streaming is amazing. I mean, think of the caliber of TV now. TV's not really. Yeah. TV anymore. I mean, it's these are like films. It's like when I watch Black Summer. I mean. It's, it's a film, it's a, you right. know, it's, right. that, it's that level of uh, storytelling and visual, you know, just the whole thing. So that, that part of streaming is great. And I actually just read, I think like yesterday that now, you know, Steven Spielberg, who I don't think was maybe the biggest supporter of streamer, like mm -hmm. they're starting to make, you know, yeah, for streaming. Netflix. yeah. The, that's funny that you say that because it was, um, it was uh, uh, Black Mirror. Talk about Black Summer. Black Mirror that really I think brought that point into focus, at least here in like mainstream USA. 
is that Netflix's series, I I honestly think more so, you know, Disney Plus is is rapidly doing uh, that yeah. in the same vein. But they are like little they are like super features when yeah. you that bingeability factor. That's the and best. <laughs> there's there's some um like Hulu shows that I watch and some Apple TV shows that I watch. Yeah. That it almost feels like it's made because there's advertising in it and it's almost it feels like it's still made like they know yeah. where the, where the Netflix and uh Disney Plus as of late like those shows yeah like you could sit there and if you've got the the attention factor capability watch an 8 hour movie in one sitting like and it is an 8 hour movie it's yeah. just broken up for your convenience um yeah no for that, sure <clears throat> What um, do you have on the horizon that you know fans that are are fans of your work from Black Summer are the the other shows that you had mentioned? Do you got anything coming out um, soonish that people would be wanting to check out? Yeah, so I uh, I think I, I mentioned briefly, but uh, I do this DreamWorks animated series called The Mighty Ones. Yeah. Kind of like, a, it's not like Adult Swim in terms of like just, it, I, th I feel like it's like, it's skewed older because it's it's like, it's like almost like a stoner comedy, but like, you know, a, a 13 year old can watch it, but I, I think, uh, you know, I can watch it and find it funny if you're into like animated series. It's, it's, it's cool. It's, it's a definitely different. Um, and that season two of that starts streaming on Hulu July 1st. Um, and then I just finished this film called the gateway with, uh, Olivia Munn and Frank Grillo and Bruce Dern. Oh, nice. That should come out, uh, at the end of the summer, um, which oh, I'm excited awesome. about. It's like a cool indie. I mean, I started out, you know, doing, you know, just tons of indie features. So I love that world um, as well. And then hopefully we'll, we'll hear sometime soon about Black Summer 3. And, uh, right yeah. you know, you can also stream uh, the Kevin James Multicam, The Crew on Netflix, which I scored as well, that came out last month. So awesome, man. Well, yeah. uh, Alec, I thank you for taking the time out to be on our show. Yeah. Um, if anybody wants to touch base, are you on uh, Twitter, or Instagram, or you know, any of yeah, that? I'm on uh, Instagram, just under my name, Alec Puro. Or, I mean, yeah, you can always. Uh, my company's called Gramoscope Music, so you can always type in my name or Gramoscope Music uh, just to kind of find out more, see you know more stuff that uh, I got going on and all that. So. Yeah. Right on, man. Well, we look forward to uh, checking out. Uh, we'll definitely check out that DreamWorks show. I yeah, guess. It's on so one. That sounds like a good time. And we'll look forward to uh, the uh, the new feature because that cast yeah. is uh, very solid. So, uh, yeah, it's a good one. It's a good uh, one. So, down the line, we will have to, uh, to get you back on at some point. Definitely. To talk about that stuff. So. Alec, again, man, thank you. Everybody, go check out Black Summer Season 2 if you haven't already, and it definitely will not disappoint you. And uh, we will talk again, buddy. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate your time. No problem.